Hey guys, welcome back. Train to Busa. First time I encountered this film, it was without any sort of advertisement. Yes, I'm one of those weirdos who just start watching a film without looking at trailers. There are so few of us and we don't always get what we deserve. But Train to Busan was a shock to my senses. I expected a sad story based on the poster about a father and his daughter. Instead, I got to the most zombie movie to ever zombie ever. <laughs> The zombies in this film are on a whole other level and barely 20 or 30 minutes in, I was already so scared because they were so unusual. Their fast movement, their glazed eyes, their unique body contortions. Oh, it was so creepy. But I'm seriously getting ahead of myself. When it comes to this movie, there are two ways to look at it. The simple, it's a zombie survival flick and nothing more. And the complicated tackling of human emotions on a whole other level. Movie. Just to get an idea of what I mean, here is one of the reviews for the film and it is hands down the most confusing review I have ever read. A zombie movie content not to aspire to any loftier subtextual readings needs little more than a skilled choreographer of action and there's plenty of evidence that this film had one in Yon. What does that even mean, Charles Bromesco? Train to, <laughs> Train to Busan got an overwhelming 94% on Rotten Tomatoes and 88 from audience scores. So you know there's something worth the confusion. So let's dive into this strangely simple yet confusing film and try to find some clarity. Probably the simplest review for this film is that Train to Busan is a chronicle of the worst birthday ever. But a more complicated approach is when you realize it ends how it starts. We start on a lifeless mannequin and end on the face of a young child completely traumatized by the events that occurred. It tells us that those events either made us more human, more emotional, or it could mean that we are turning into that lifeless mannequin. We meet a trader who is transporting goods and already there seems to be some kind of outbreak ongoing. Trader think it's something to do with swine flu or something of that sort. We later find out I think that it has something to do with fish. In this brief moment with this man, he runs something over and leaves it there to die. The way this first part is shot, and nearly the whole film, you feel present in the moment, waiting for the worst case scenario. I don't know if it's the close-ups, the unsteadiness, or the fact that a lot of the environment is hidden from our view, and we have to assume what's going on behind, to the side, or even straight ahead in relation to our characters. So it turns out that he hit a deer and when it gets up, I got chills. It is so, so creepy. After this, we switch to and remain with the main character of the film. Working class manager, something about trade, I really wasn't paying attention to what he does because he's a fund manager. The complicated thought here is that he's the type of person that people hate. Hear me out. The type who wipes off minuscule amounts of that of their insanely expensive cars. The type who only cares about themselves and is so engrossed in their work to not notice other people's needs. I think this also tries to speak onto the mentality in countries where work and profit come before everything else. Maybe it speaks more on the Korean mindset willing to give up on socialization for the sake of their careers. But it is a global problem and everyone can relate. We see just how much he cares about himself by the question he asks his junior. This is his kid, mind you, and he has no idea what she likes. Tomorrow is her birthday and her father and mother are going through a messy divorce. So on her birthday, she wants to visit her mother in Busan. And she is so desperate to do that, that she is willing to go there alone. And the reason for that is because her father is never really there for her. He missed a really important recital and we only learn of its importance much, much later. To keep her safe, therefore, her father agrees to go with her to Busan and they get on a very early train. That's the setup for the whole movie. It really is just about this train to Busan, or rather everything that happens within this journey. And I kind of like that. We are trapped with the passengers experiencing things as they do from their perspective. So the gravity of the problem is only as big as we and the characters see it. One major problem with survival films is usually the introduction of new characters. It's never spontaneous like, oh, he's just a passenger, oh, that's just another passenger. They literally force it upon us that this person and this person are important to the story. 
This film is no exception except for how quickly they introduce the other people. For a start, the conductors and the help around the train are introduced almost seamlessly and we build a strong bond with them because hey, it's the same in almost every film, the staff are there to the end, but <laughs> no. Other characters are treated with a passing glance but are much more important to the story. They are the hidden heroes that we later on come to really care about. And then there are characters who are just like, notice me, notice me, I'm important in this movie. Which I'm not against to be honest, survival films have to make us care and love the characters almost instantly because we don't get to know much about them. Especially the type of films where they die as soon as we see them. So sticking with cliches is very important and useful. The steward and the stewardess who may have secret crushes on each other. Intrigue box checked. The lovers who are yet to be open to each other. Romance box checked. Handsomeness check. Two siblings check. The crazy guy check. Of course, that is always a crazy guy in survival films. I don't know how they do it. The annoying guy check, check, check. The lead emotional story, check. And the last few moments of sanity, check. I loved that closing of the doors. It was just perfect. The one major character introduction that I loved is the man outside the toilet. And that's how I recognized him. I don't know if that's a check, but check. Giving us everything we need to know about a character doesn't mean sacrificing nuance. This character isn't hammered into our brains, but he serves a purpose in the film later on. And to be honest with you, I kind of really enjoy a massive introduction of so many characters. <laughs> so the zombies attack and I have to give mad props to how they did this. These are the most zombies, zombies to ever zombie, zombie ever. From the moment they are introduced, you're petrified by their insane acrobatic movements, their glassy eyes and their bloodthirst. They don't move like this throughout the rest of the film, probably because some of these actors didn't want to break every bone in their body, but the introduction is so amazing. <laughs> Another good reason for setting the entire movie on a train is to highlight the blatant disregard people have for each other, even in confined spaces. You see someone rolling on the ground and you think, whatever's going on there has got nothing to do with me. Then you go back to your book or your movie, such that the only attentive character looking around, learning about people around her, is the little girl. She's the only one quick to build bonds, to notice trouble coming much faster than the adults. And I think that's also another complicated message in the film. If we were much more attentive and caring to one another, that man, for instance, wouldn't have left that deer on the road and would have discovered the danger much earlier, reporting it to the authorities. The passengers would have noticed the woman acting abnormal and responded quickly enough to prevent the catastrophe. To further emphasize the bigger picture that we are not attentive to each other, people are literally screaming, running away, and those who don't know what's going on are like, what? Some weirdos. And those running don't even stop to explain the situation, every man for himself, I guess. I mean, the most unintentionally funny part of the movie is this moment right here, when this woman is attacked in front of all these people, and they're just like, what? Some weirdos. <laughs> And after this, I was on the edge of my seat. The fast pace, the panic, these first few minutes of the attack were one of the best adrenaline kicking moments I've ever experienced in a film in a long time. I loved it. I think here is where we venture again into the simple and the complicated meaning. As these strangers are forced into survival, the simple answer is, um, run. Doesn't matter who falls behind you, run. Get away as fast as possible, even if you have to jump over a few helpless people. We see that time and time again as characters who sacrifice their time to help someone else usually end up dead. But the complicated reasoning is that this is a fault of society. The lives we lead teaches us not to care for one another, so these people aren't acting strange at all. That's exactly how we are expected to act in this day and age. Sidestep while someone is literally fighting for their lives, and even going a step further to shut the door in front of helpless people. <laughs> 
It also says a lot that the kill started in the lower classes and everyone ends up fighting for survival in the first class, which I assume is has a meaning but I wouldn't venture into that one. Another complicated reasoning in the film that touches on society is who we care about. We are expected to care about our friends, our children, and I think the film brings this out perfectly in this one scene. The husband comforting his pregnant wife, the father comforting his daughter, both of them asking them to sit down. <laughs> the grandmother calling both of them worried about them. It is honestly a touching bit of filming that's made more profound when everything goes silent and the grandmother dies. Mama? I think this section of the film is very important. If we were to look at it simply, then yes, we do care about those who are closest to us. But the complicated view comes in when just a few seconds into the film we see a lot of people begging to be let into the train and we know that's not going to happen. So the transition from this to this and we emotionally are pulled into caring for these strangers because we see how much care these groups have for each other. So the film is kind of saying that we should see everyone as that important person to someone else. All these people dying are lovers, brothers, fathers, daughters to someone else this message is later repeated as the child, the only attentive one, repeats an act of kindness to a stranger. And to this, the father says that she shouldn't be so good. Which, remember, he's not acting abnormal. That's exactly how we act nowadays. Can you imagine someone giving up their seat on a train? It's unheard of. Then we get to the news report, which given our current state is somewhat eerily similar to what we hear on the news now. Don't panic, it's under control. Then we get this shot which I absolutely love as when these normal people start walking in a zombie-like fashion because they are panicking and worried that it might not actually be under control. Anxiety, fear kind of turns us normal people into zombies as we are desperate to find safety and protection. From this point on in the film, it's just good old survival movie and punching zombies in the face, which was very funny. This character shaped up to be one of my favorite heroes in a film and they probably buffed him up for that purpose. And we get the moments I hate in every horror. Have I told you that sometimes I just hate horror because people act very, very dumb for no reason. I always find myself wanting to scream, stop staring and run get up and run why are you looking at that just run frustration isn't the same as a good scare but i guess it builds momentum if you're into that kind of thing and this film also suffers from the second thing that i absolutely hate which is the last minute syndrome where everything has to happen at the exact last minute i think these are the things that turn a brilliant film into a normal one <laughs> It is during this second half of the film that we learn what started the zombie outbreak. The company our main character was in charge of somehow caused the outbreak. It's something that's in the water which means it is a continuous thing that will never end which does fit into society a lot that society is going through some problems that will never end until we discover the root source of the problem. And the one thing I love the most about the movie is the type of zombie that they represent. We've already seen how weirdly they move and how deadly they are but what's even more interesting are the things that you can use to beat them. First, they don't see in the darkness. Second, they respond to sound no matter where the source comes from and our characters use these two weaknesses really well to their advantage. In this case, why not wait until nightfall and then start moving towards safety? Literally stop the train, everyone get into a sleeping position and wait it out. And then next night, lure them all into a trap with some kind of loud music. Easy. Done. <laughs> And when it comes to much slower zombies from other movies, just stand in an open field somewhere, pour gasoline on a large, long straight line, stand on the side without the zombies and call out to them. As soon as they start running towards you, light the fuse and just, they're all gone. <laughs> I think Game of Thrones had this idea, so shh, don't tell anyone, but I think zombie apocalypse are probably the easiest ones to beat. As we near the end of the film, the character traits come back into play again. The annoying guy remains annoying, acting like the antagonist and adding social commentary on the uncaring, rich person. <laughs> Uh, 
but turns out that this villain deep down is just as scared as everyone else, desperate to return to the loved one. Saying that he wants to return to his mother was very shocking to me. It turned someone that I had grown to hate with a passion into someone I pity suddenly. I think there's a lesson in there somewhere, but I hate this character too much to go hunting for it. But yeah, it was it was heartbreaking to watch him go through this transformation where he was literally killing everyone and then now he's desperate to survive. My hero dies. One of my favorite characters just died and it was done very respectfully. He sacrificed himself for the sake of everyone else, which goes to show that giving up something for someone else is still valuable, even though it will take something from you. And then there's a hidden story of the two sisters. It's very small, very hidden, but there is also a simple and complicated story. One of the sisters is proud while the other is kind and thoughtful. We can tell who is who by just the amount of makeup the proud sister wears. They get separated and we see how much they meant to each other. Later on, as they are just about to be reunited, the kind sister sacrifices herself to protect everyone else. After seeing this, the proud sister heartbroken opens the door to the zombies and gets almost everyone killed. The simple meaning is that of tragedy. The two sisters who are very different are still inseparable from each other. It's the kind of thing that could happen to people who are scared of the world, scared of building new bonds, scared of being hated even, and they are desperate to stick to their established loves, family and friends. It's like how sometimes twins never leave each other even into their old age. So when one died, the other couldn't possibly live on and had to die as well. The more complicated reasoning is that they represent society as well. The proud and the kind, the rich and the poor, the loved and the unloved, the famous and the infamous, were inseparable from each other. And if one dies, well, the other one does too. If it's not the literal death death, then it's the fact that the one who survives loses their humanity and willingly chooses to become a zombie. And then the saddest ending of all is the father and the daughter. I think this is easier looking at it from a simple mindset. In fact, there's no need for a deep meaning. It's just obvious how important certain relationships are. And we see this in the daughter begging her father to stay with her. This dynamic carries the film and if you are soft you are going to cry, trust me. The father comes to the realization of what is more important when he too gets infected. But before the water works, I just have to say, it is also a very bizarre ending that makes me believe that this man wanted to die. I don't know why he wanted to die, but he wanted to die. Because based on what we've seen already, people punching zombies in the face, there are literally 5,000 ways to prevent getting beaten and he could have survived if he wanted to. But anyway, after he gets himself bit, towards the end as the father dies, he suddenly is hit with a deep sadness on having missed out in spending time with his daughter. We see this in the dreamlike visions of his daughter's birth, probably acting as the last regrets a person has before they turn into a zombie. Honestly, really touching moment. Something else that's interesting about this ending is how different it is from the survival aspect of the film, the zombies and the fast pace. I think the film was too greedy in this area, wanting to be both a high suspense action film and a soft touching psychological film at the same time. And in a tiny way, trying to be both loud and soft almost hurt the film. I wish they stuck with the soft angle, made the zombies a looming threat until the very last moment and shared more of the heart of the film. But then I realized that the reason the film has a heart to begin with is because of the attack of the zombies and the eventual death of our main character. It ends with a girl and pregnant wife. And I think you've noticed at this point, I have completely shied away from using their names, but Suan and her new guardian walk through a tunnel to get to safety. Tunnel, darkness, the only place zombies can't attack, it's a very interesting message at the end. The humans on the other side almost kill them, but being attentive, Suan starts singing the song she meant to sing to her father and it saves them both. And we end on that haunting image of the girl in tears. The Train to Busan is a rare masterpiece. 
Complicated, yes, but special. It puts in so much by taking on both the fast-paced action survival genre and mixing that with a soft tone better suited to a psychological drama. If you watch it passively, you miss all the parallels, all the hints of much more complex storytelling. Does that mean it shouldn't have been a zombie flick? No, no, no. In all honesty, it's probably one of the best zombie films I've ever seen, with a side of big emotions. So yeah, I loved it. One of my favorite zombie films ever, and I bet I'll remember it for a long, long time to come. I give this movie a perfect 8 out of 10. I don't know why I'm rating all my new reviews, but yes, 8 out of 10. So thanks guys so much for watching. I'm always very grateful. Tell me what you like most about the film, and if I have missed any complex psychological storylines, don't forget to subscribe, it'll mean a lot. Have a great weekend, and I'll see you next time. Bye.